Okay, this is an introduction to the Arduino Uno a prototyping board. And we're going to go into depth on the board than most people would because I want you to understand everything that you're looking at rather than it just being a bunch of hardware and say, what is this thing? We're going to educate you and get you to at least understand what all the components are and what they're for and how they're manufactured. So, as you know, the Arduino Uno is an open source project that the Arduino company in Italy has made open source, which means just about any manufacturer can make their own Arduino Uno boards and other boards like the Due and so on. Um, <clears throat> most of them will come with a plastic carrier, which helps you mount the board without shorting the pins. Um, I didn't have the right screws, so I had to modify mine, and this is a little beat up over the years, but it does the job. And this is a little carrier. I'm going to snap it back in. And I'm going to take this on and off a few times during the video just so we can talk about various features. So let's talk about the board itself. The circuit board, also called the uh, printed circuit board, PCB, or printed wiring board, PWB, is a board made of FR4, flame-resistant 4 material. 4 meaning uh, formula number 4, I believe. So FR4, and that's so if the board ever catch, if, if any component catches fire, the whole board will generally be flame resistant, fire resistant, because it's made of a fiberglass and epoxies that hold the board together. It gives it a nice stiff board so that we can put traces on it and components. So the boards come in various sizes and shapes and thicknesses and even colors, but they're basically FR4 in, for the most part in commercial circuit boards or printed wiring boards. Now the main thing you'll see the printing wiring board has just that. It has these little traces of copper printed wire like we printed them. Actually they were etched away. This surface began as a surface of solid copper and then a mask was placed down and it was etched with acids and then the mask was washed away and it left copper traces. These are our wires. That's why we call it printed wiring board. Some people call it printed circuit board because we put circuits on it. But you can call it print circuit board, PCB, PWB, printed wiring board, circuit board, board, what have you. They're all basically the same thing. <clears throat> now, the traces are made of copper, but covering this whole board is a material called solder mask. And later on, when they solder the board, they don't want solder sticking to all that other copper that's on there. So they put this, this uh, coating on there, and it's got, it exposes only the areas where we want solder to stick. So everywhere else, if you've got a drop of solder on there, it's going to wash away later on. It won't stick to the board. It makes it cleaner. So that's why you see this bluish-green material over everything, and there's traces underneath, circuit traces. Now these little holes are called vias, V-I-A, which means through, or via, or by way of, an Italian. And Arduino is an Italian company, <clears throat> but in the industry, these are called vias. No matter where you go, it's just a word that we... Um, inherited from the from the Italians, from the Italian language, which means through, or via, uh, way. So we have vias, and these are little holes that are drilled in the board after the plating, and they're after the after the etching, and they're plated through. So signals on this side of the board can get to a signal on the other side of the board. Let's see, so that gives us a great ability, so the wires won't can cross each other. A wire can come cross, go up through the board come over here, go down through the board, and get to virtually anywhere on the circuit board without having to run into another trace. Of course, you want to minimize your vias when you're doing that, but we have software that helps us do that, and Arduino already built the board for us, so we don't have to worry about it. I just wanted to let you know that there are circuit boards, uh, circuit traces, and you can see there's large areas, what we call lands, which is usually just a big area of copper that we didn't even bother etching. There's no need to, and there's reasons why we do that, but we'll get into that later. So, the the circuit board also has, printed wiring board, has holes for mounting the board, not to be confused with the V's, which are small, and of course all the components. So the review, the circuit board is made of FR4 um, material, and it's got traces on both sides, and actually some boards can actually have traces in between the layers. And I'll show you right here. Right in here. 
this board doesn't have it, but we can actually put one, two, maybe up to 20 or so layers in the printed wiring board and gives us more routing capability, you know, trace capability. But the, I believe the Arduino only has traces on two sides, which makes the board cheaper and easier to manufacture. But in larger boards, that'll be, you know, many traces. So FR4 material, circuit traces on both sides, etched away, vias that connect the traces through the board to the other side, solder mask, these are stenciling or silk screened lettering, so that helps us to identify what the components are, what pins are. Not everything can be silk screened on there, but you try to do as much as you can as a board designer. And uh, what else? That's about it of, of the printed wiring board. Then on the board itself, we have components. We have these, which are called headers, another one for a special kind of connector. And these are female headers, and these are male headers. Male headers stick out and female headers go in. So if you had a male header like this in a connector, you can plug that right into the female. Another connector would be right here into the female headers. So that's what we call the sex of a connector, and it's not to be sexist, it's just the way we've been doing it for years. So um, those are headers. The main component on the board is this microcontroller board uh, chip. And it's called a dual inline package, DIP. Dual inline pin, dual inline package. That's because there's two rows of pins on either side. Okay, these are called SIPs, straight inline or single inline package. This is a kind of like a dip in a way, but it's really a header. We use dips more for microcircuits, integrated circuits, than actual connectors. All right, then we have a, a power connector here, which allows us to power up the board through a nine volt power adapter that can plug in here. We also have a USB connector that connects to our host computer so we can program the microcontroller and you can uh, control you can also get back feedback from the from the controller to see what's going on inside so that's our main interface point there's also a reset button that can reset the microcontroller um, when the microcontroller powers up it automatically has a circuit on here somewhere that causes it to reset and start from its beginning of its program but you can interrupt that and stop it and say, hey, start over again, and you can press that by depressing the reset. But again, the processor doesn't need a reset to get it going. It has a power-up circuit when you first power it up or after you program it. So what else do we have? We have other components. Like This is a little um, microcontroller that Atmel makes, and it basically makes a USB interface between your computer and the microcontroller. Uh, there needs to be some translation and some logic level shifting in there, so this um, controls all that and is the, is the main interface between your computer and your target, which is this microcontroller from Atmel. There are other components on here, like this is a regulator. When you bring the 9 volts DC in, we regulate it down to 5 volts and we filter it through these filter capacitors in this inductor. Because this chip doesn't work off of 9 volts, it works off of 5. But the nice thing is you could plug a 9 volt adapter in here and you can still have 9 volts available, V in here for this pin, but then the board will regulate that down to 3.3 and 5 volts, which this chip and other chips need, all from one power supply. So that's why we use a 9-volt power supply, or up to 12-volt. It's variable because no matter what the voltage is here within range, this regulator will make sure we have the 5 and 3.3 volts automatically regulated. And these are capacitors that filter out and make it smoother, and we'll get into that later. This is an, a crystal, which makes an oscillator for this USB adapter. And right here is a tiny little oscillator or crystal for the microcontroller. Now what, it, what an oscillator or crystal does is it creates a clock. A clock is a signal that goes high and low, 0 and, three point, zero and 5 volts. High, low, 0 and three, 5 volts is high. And it goes from low to high, low to high, high, low, high, low, high, low, high, low, millions of times a second, millions, and then megahertz as we call that. And that is the heartbeat for the controller. The microcontroller uses the clock to control all its internal logic. Everything's built on a clock. Even though this has other features inside, everything is digital. And this chip happens to use a lower frequency clock because it has a bigger crystal, but it has its own crystal to control its own clock. All right. So we have other components on the board, like this would be like a resistor. Here's a resistor pack that has four resistors in it. That's an LED. We talked about the uh, crystals more LED, uh, more resistor packs, capacitors, more LEDs, um, there's, I don't know what this chip is, um, transistors, capacitors all over the place, resistors, the reset button, and I believe this is a fuse and a transistor, and of course we said that was the regulator. 
So those are the basic components on a board. Now some components are actually through hole, like these headers. They're mounted through hole. That means there's holes drilled in the board and the pins of the component go right through the board and solder on the other side of the board. Okay, so you can see that these were soldered on this side of the board. And this dip is on a socket which was soldered to the other side of the board. And this, this connector and these connectors over here are also through hole devices. But if you look carefully, you're going to see there's other types of devices on the board. And we call these SMT, surface mount technology. Let's look at this one for instance. There's no holes for these pins. The, the chip, the device, is soldered right to the surface. We call that surface mount technology. And in the 70s, you know, chips were mainly dips or um, through holes. But since the 80s, we started using more and more surface mount, and we can get, as you can see, you get very small packages. Look at the pins. You can never get a soldering iron on that today. Back then, you could, but today, things are made by comp you know computers and big factories, so that we can really get the pins fine pitch, as we call it, very small di distances. These are like on the order of these are a tenth of an inch apart, and these can be four times as dense. So that's the nice thing about surface mount technology. Now, how does the surface mount technology work? Well, remember I told you about the solder mask. So there's places where these pads, where this chip is going to go before the chip is on there, and there's pads for each, where each pin is going to connect. There's a metal plate that is made by the manufacturer that lay, rests down over the board before any components are placed on. And then a, a, a solder mask, a solder paste, is squeegeed over the, the plate, and the plate is lifted, and every little place where we want solder, there's going to be a little bit of solder left over on those pads. I'm not talking about the, sur the through holes, this is just the surface mount stuff. So you can see most of this stuff is surface mount. Then there's a machine called a pick and place, where there's reels of components. They're all on a reel, like a, like a movie reel. And it's a big machine, and there's multiple reels for each type of component. And the pick and place machine is going to use a suction cup, pull the part off the reel, turn it, orientate it, find the spot, and pop it down in place, and then pick up another component and place it. And that's called pick and place. And it's very quick. It's going to be like this. It's picking off the wheel and pulling it down. So it could populate a board like this within a few seconds. So after the board has all been placed now, the, the solder paste kind of holds the uh, components in position. And you can see there's, they're pretty tiny. But there would be a little bit of paste there holding that in place. And that was done on a, on a conveyor belt. So after it's done with the pick and place, the conveyor belt moves down the line and it moves into an oven with progressively hotter and hotter sections of the oven, compartments in the oven, to the finally where it gets at the hottest part where it's enough to make the solder flow. We do this gradually so it won't thermally shock the board and crack it. We want to bring the temperature up slowly and down again. And then when it gets to that temperature, all the solder will start to flow around the pins and the pads. And we call this reflowing or flowing. And then, after a short time there, it goes and continues on through uh, progressively cooler and cooler ovens until it exits the oven. And then it goes to usually a washing machine. Now, inside the, inside the solder is a material called flux. It helps the solder stick to the pads and the pins. It kind of like cleans it. It's a chemical. It's an acid, actually. It's mixed in with the flux. Well, a lot of that uh, mixed in with the solder. So the flux has to be, any residue of the flux has to be washed off the board usually. There are some that don't need to be. For the most part, you're going to wash the flux off. And you're going to wash the whole board. And that's how all the surface mount components are done. So it's a little more involved in the old days of putting parts in and hand soldering them or wave soldering it. But we can get smaller pitches and we can get more components and cheaper components on a board. So after you've, you know, you've reflowed, after you've you know, um, surface mounted, then you, you, another pick and place machine would put all the components on the board that are so, uh, through hole. And then what happens is it goes down through a thing called a wave solder. And it's like, like my finger would be like this bubble of solder, almost like a little waterfall. And it would travel right over that liquid solder. And it would suck up to the pins and solder it perfectly like that. So that's how through hole is done. You can see through hole is a simpler process. It's older. And we don't have as fine density. But there's still uses for it. And if you look right here, there's a little bit of solder or something on there. So... Sometimes solder does end up on the, uh, the solder mask, but it doesn't stick to it too well. It's like a plastic. Okay, so now you see that the surface mount and through hole devices. Okay, so now let's uh, reiterate that. Okay. Oh, so, sorry I keep plugging this in and out, but that's all right. So we have a 
circuit board, printer wiring board, made of FR4, flame resistant 4 material, which is basically fiberglass and adhesives, that gives us at least one trace, one surface trace, and another surface trace at the component side and the solder side, in this case. Okay, and there's circuit traces etched during the you know, manufacturing process. And there's solder mask applied so it's, it's, solder doesn't stick everywhere to the board. And there's silk screen stenciling the market. And there's vias drilled in so the signals can get from one side of the board to the other and they're plated through. And then all the components are soldered down and they're either done through pick and place and uh, surface mount or they're wave soldered through, through holes. We have our power connector, we have our USB connector, we have our reset switch, which allows us to start, restart the process anytime we want. We have surface mount technology devices, we have through holes, we have, these, are, these are crystals that create the clock, the heartbeat for the chips. We have all sorts of components like resistors, capacitors, and inductors, and we'll get into that later. We have female headers and male headers, which are connectors, and uh, we have LEDs. And this little LED is a red LED that you can actually program, and that's one of the first programs we're going to write, is to make this LED turn on and off. And one of these pins on this microcontroller is going to turn that LED right on. So if we looked at the schematics, you'd find out that one pin of this LED would actually work its way back through these traces to one of the pins on this device. And it's not going to seem that foreign to you. I believe this is a fuse, that's a transistor, surface mount again, capacitors, we're going to get into what those do, little capacitors, little resistors, and a reset button, I said. And I think that's about it. So now, when you look at an Arduino board, it's not as foreign to you. You say, oh yeah, I remember this. Now you know what all these traces do. These are connections. And these little holes make the signal go through the board. And this is not just a simple board. It's, there's a lot of technology. It's got traces and layers. And it's got solder mask and silk screen. And there's surface mount and through hole devices. And it's an amazing little thing. And for like $15, um, you get a nice, basically, computer on a chip. Okay, and like I said, the, the, the microcontroller is like a microprocessor. It's a little different. A microprocessor just um, does math and processes data, manipulates data. This does that and a little bit more. It also has interfaces for serial and, and inter uh, parallel and analog and digital and has its own memory that controls, the, holds the program, and its own RAM the, to, to con perform all the calculations it's doing and um, like a scratch pad, it's like you know, writing things down. So there's RAM and ROM and EEPROM and Flash and all that and there's all sorts of interfaces on here and a little microprocessor. So it's not as powerful as a large microprocessor like you find in your PC, but it's a small microprocessor with all sorts of peripherals, as we call them, peripherals around the end. And those peripherals, with that, makes this a microcontroller, not just a microprocessor. And microcontrollers are great because we can do a lot more with them with less components. They're not as fast, but we, you know, we're learning. So that's what the microcontroller is. Now, uh, so one of the other things I wanted to show you was that the microcontroller is in a DIP, dual inline package. It could have been soldered directly to the board, but Arduino was smart and they put it on a socket for us. And you may be wondering, why do we want to chip on a socket? Well, we're new to the Arduino. And we can very easily blow out this chip if we don't hook it up right. Since we're new and we're learning, we're probably going to make a mistake and we're probably eventually going to blow up the chip or blow up one of the pins at least. So our Arduino on the Dewey this is the R4 version. And you can see that it'll say right here, R3 version, sorry. Model R3. All right, this model has the, has the microcontroller in a dual inline package on a socket. And the reason is we can remove it. Now, normally there are special tools that you use to remove this. Now, I've been doing this for 30, almost 40 years. So I, I have a trick that I do that's very safe. You could use like a plastic tool, would be better, but I didn't have one with me. So I'm going to work my way carefully underneath this chip. Again, don't do this at home. You should have uh, someone who, who knows how to remove the chips do it for you. And you carefully work your way, because you can break the chip or break the board or both. And you don't want to damage anything. And then we can slowly remove the chip. You don't never want to do this with power on, of course. Power should always be off when you're moving the chip, because you can short things out. So the chip can come off the board. That way, if we blow out the chip, we could just plug another one in. And this chip is about $2.50. It's amazing what you're getting, all this microcontroller for $2.50 from Atmel. And there's a part number on it. It's hard to see. It's, it's uh, silk screened on there, but 
I'm going to turn it slowly and maybe the light will eventually show you. There's markings on there that you should be able to read. And, of course, if you go to um, Arduino, they'll have these in stock. It's always good to pick up a couple of extra of these to have them laying around. So when you're ready to plug in the chip, the replacement chip, you have to notice one thing. You can't plug this chip in backwards. If you do, you're going to blow it out. And you can't be offset by pins. It's got to be fully in, and it's got to be in the right direction, the right orientation. Well, if you look right here, there's a little notch right there on the socket. And right here, there's a little notch on the chip. That notch should line up with this notch. And you should make sure you're on all the pins. Don't be offset by one either way. Make sure they're all in there and line up. And then you're going to push the chip in. This one also has, but that's not always there, is a pin 1 indicator. A little dimple. And that's closest to pin 1. So if you're looking at a chip, okay, pin 1 is always to the left of the notch. If this is a notch, pin 1 is always here. And it's always a good idea for some manufacturers to put the pin 1 dimple there, but they don't always do it. But you always know if you see this is the notch, you know that's pin 1. And you know the notch must be aligned with the notch on the socket. Or there might be a notch drawn on the board with silk screen or a little dot somewhere. There's some kind of indicator or a little arrow that shows you where pin 1 is and what direction pins flow and the numbering. And there's some indicator. This one doesn't have any indicator other than the socket has a notch in it. So you make sure you get the right orientation. Don't put in backwards. Make sure power's off. You line up the pins, and there's actually tools that help you insert this, but again, I know what I'm doing, and you push the chip in until it's seated, and now you've replaced your chip. And that's why um, we need the one with the dip. Now, you can get Arduino Unos that don't have the dip. There's like a chip, a square chip mounted right about here, and it's all surface mounted. And it's a little cheaper, the board, but you know what? If that little chip blows out, you're done. You've got to throw away the board because you're not going to have the ability to do fine soldering like this. You don't have a reflow machine. So until you get started with learning to control microcontrollers and, and basically get your sea legs, as we say, and make your mistakes, the Arduino Uno is the perfect part because the perfect the board to start with because as you make mistakes, don't worry, you can always replace this chip. Eventually, you're going to make less and less mistakes. And me, I hardly make any mistakes, but even then, I've been doing this for 30 some odd years. I even make mistakes sometimes, so accidents happen. But you're going to be careful. And another thing what I didn't tell you is when you're handling a board, and I have a wrist strap on, you can't see. And this is usually an um, electrostatic discharge surface. Static electricity is always around us, and it can damage these, these devices. So when you handle a board, if you don't have ESD protection, you know, like a mat or wrist straps or all that, and we'll get into the ESD later, you should handle the board by its edges. Don't try to touch the pins if you can, okay? It's not the best thing, but it's better than nothing. See, I have a wrist strap on, which is grounding me, which is taking all the static electricity off of me. Now, you've heard had the static electricity like in the wintertime. You walk across a carpet, right, and you zap someone on the ear, and it makes it little and, and it sparks them, and it hurts. That's what electrostatic discharge is. The funny thing is that you can destroy these components even if you don't feel an arc or a sweat. Um, if I didn't have a wrist strap on, and I rubbed um, my hand on this piece of paper, Right? I could have put a volt, a couple hundred volts on my fingers. And if I touched the board, that voltage would have gone into the board and possibly damaged it. So electrostatic discharge is all around us. And you may not even feel it, but the circuitry is very sensitive to it. And especially with today's technology called CMOS, complementary metal oxide semiconductors, which we'll get into someday, um, they're very susceptible to static, and I can show you why. It's a very thin film in the microns and the electricity can punch right through that and damage. But sometimes when you damage a component, it doesn't completely destroy it. It wounds it. We call it walking wounded. It's degraded. It seems to work fine. But when you least expect it, it's finally going to fail. And you know when it fails is when you present it, when you're showing your project to somebody, right? That's when things fail. Murphy's Law. So you have to learn about ESD, and I'm going to have another video on that. But remember, I mounted this to a piece of wood, which is not the best ESD, but I'm... I'm doing subtle things that you guys can't see. I'm always keeping my hands with my wrist straps to keep everything static free. And if I want, I can have an ionizer blowing on here. So that's pretty much it for the, the Arduino Uno. We're going to get into the next video where we're going to talk about actually programming the microcontroller and what we can do with it. So I hope that you've seen that now when you look at an Arduino board or any circuit board today, 
it's not going to be as foreign to you. You're going to say, oh, I know what all this is. All right, and that was the purpose of this video. So I thank you for your attention and stand by for other videos.